The idea that we're talking about the President of the United States using an anti-Semitic trope sitting in the Oval Office is absolutely mind-boggling. Jews aren't a political football. We shouldn't be used as if we were a tool in a partisan debate. We're not a monolith. And the loyalty we have as Americans is no different than the loyalty of any other American. And frankly, I'm just sick and tired of having to deal with this kind of bigotry. In case you forgot what Donald Trump said to prompt that reaction, here it is. Any Jewish people that vote for a Democrat, uh, I think it shows either a total lack of knowledge or great disloyalty. The very next day, Trump tweeted a thank you to a right-wing commentator for saying that Jewish people love the president, quote, like he's the king of Israel, like he is the second coming of God. Joining me now is Frank Schaefer, religious reform activist and author of Why I Am an Atheist Who Believes in God, and Jen Rubin, MSNBC political analyst and opinion writer for The Washington Post. Jennifer, I'm going to start with you. Um, we know that really since the 1930s, um, Jewish Americans have voted in the vast majority for Democrats. Here it is in the latest election in 2018, 79 to 17, voted for a Democratic candidate. Here is the way that Donald Trump, on the other hand, has spoken about Jewish people. This is from the Republican Jewish Coalition. This is a 2015 speech. Here it is. I'm in a different position than the other candidates because I'm the one candidate, I don't want any of your money. I want your support, but I don't want your money. I, again, uh, I don't want your money, therefore you're probably not going to support me because stupidly you want to give money. Trump doesn't want money. I really believe the Iran deal, look, I'm a negotiator like you folks, we're negotiators. We don't build gas stations in the middle of, as you know, Afghanistan for 43 million. How many think they could have done it for less? Would you raise your hands, please? Do you want to renegotiate deals? We, some of us renegotiate deals. I would say about 99.9. Is there anybody that doesn't renegotiate deals in this room? This room negotiates. I want to renegotiate this room. Perhaps more than any room I've ever spoken to. Maybe more. Okay, uh, I have to undo my face, I'm sorry. Um, this is a guy who has reportedly said he only wanted guys with yarmulkes counting his money, then goes right to Jewish people and says, I don't want your money. Oh, okay, so that is literally the way that you speak to Jewish people. It's just about money. That is the biggest stereotype on earth. Um, on and on and on, Charlottesville and... What is going on here, Jennifer? Please explain this to me. All right. Um, as my friend Yara Rosenberg says, um, this is a guy who's anti-Semitic, but he thinks what he's saying is complimentary to <laughs> Jews. Um, and uh, that is true. Um, all of this is also evidence of what you and I have talked about a lot in the last year or so. Everything he's doing for Israel is not for Jews. He doesn't care about American Jews. He cares about his evangelical base. Um, and so he is both anti-Semitic and pro-Israel. And that is possible, too. Um, it has nothing to do with Jewish Americans. He expects Jews to vote purely on Israel for us to be disloyal and not to consider everything else. And of course, American Jews have traditionally voted their values. Um, and he embodies none of them. Um, he is an affront. Um, every time he attacks immigrants, every time he attacks the rule of law, American Jews don't like this. Um, and they're one of the groups that has opposed him the strongest. Um, so I think what we're seeing is um, the real Donald Trump, how he really thinks, um, and that um, whatever he's doing for Israel or to to Israel um, is a way of carrying on his culture war, is a way of carrying on his war against uh, Muslims, is a way of um, stoking his base, has nothing to do with the long-term relationship of U.S. and uh, Israel, um, you know, uh, relations down the road, um, which have been damaged by this. Um, and I think um, I agree with Mr. Greenblatt from the ADL. Um, Stop, leave us out of this. Stop using us <laughs> as a football. Yeah, and Frank, can you just explain this to those who may not be uh, about it? Because there, there is a lot of expression of love for Israel, and Donald Trump even claiming that American Jews, that their prime minister is in Israel, even though they're Americans, which is weird. But there is an evangelical, you know, sort of obsession with and affection for Israel. Can you explain what that is about? Because it does seem like the end times don't go well for the Israelis in this scenario, but please explain. Yeah, well, you know, I come from an evangelical background, and <clears throat> my father, Francis Schaeffer, was a leader of the evangelical movement in the 70s and 80s, and then I, as his nepotistic sidekick, fled the movement, so I look back on it uh, as someone who grew up in it. You have to understand, evangelical theology says when Jesus comes back, Israel will be destroyed. Only 144,000 Jews will survive, and those are the ones who have, quote, been saved and believed in Jesus. So. 
the evangelical fascination with Israel, like Donald Trump's, is not the love of Israel. It is the love of the apocalypse, and Israel plays a part in this. So I just want to note something here, and that is that Trump has had a racialist, not just racist, but a racialist fixation through his whole life. His dad and he conspired to keep black people out of their buildings. He's always making these comments. He takes out full-page ads about the, the kids who were falsely arrested in, in Central Park. This goes on and on, and this is part of this. And I would just like to add one other thing. Not only are the evangelical white nationalist voters his real audience, and they are very suspicious of Jews, very anti-Semitic to their core when it comes to them saying that Jews are all lost and going to burn in hell, they love Israel because it is strong. It goes to war. It looks like them. There are guns around. They fight. Lastly, I want to add one more thing. I don't think that the full uh, understanding of this thing has come about, and that is that Trump has painted a target on the back of liberal Jews. He has said, if I lose in 2020, you know who to blame. And who is it? It's the Jews again for being, quote, disloyal. And I grew up in Europe. I grew up at a time when there were still marks of the Second World War, when the gas chambers and all the rest were not tourist meccas yet. This is real stuff. Now, he's a fool, and so he doesn't perhaps understand what he's unleashing. But when you paint a target on the back of Jews and say, your disloyalty will cost me the election, that's what he's saying. Yeah. It has nothing yeah. to do with the Jewish vote. He is now back in the camp of white nationalism and the genocide that came about in Europe when Hitler blamed the Jews for their economic problems in the Weimar Republic. Make no mistake, this is horror, and this is coming from the American president. He is a disgusting individual, and he has to be stopped. And this puts the stakes of 2020 even higher. Yeah. The real message is the opposite of what he said, and that is those who are loyal Americans are going to rise up and vote against this racialist, disgusting human being. And, you know, Jennifer, the thing about that that, that is, you know, even more terrifying is that, you know, to that very point, it's a weird thing where Donald Trump says all of these things about being pro-Israel and being, you know, the Jewish people should be with him, and yet what he's unleashing, to Frank's point, is a lot of really frightening anti-Semitic violence. You know, we even saw, remember, the Beastie Boys um, grave, you know, desecrated in New York by these people. You know, you're seeing, and then, so it is a strange thing to happen. Do you ever wonder why Jared Kushner uh, who is his son-in-law and who is Jewish doesn't say anything about any of this. He's been really quiet through all of this. I, I assume it's some combination of pathology and greed. So I, that's the only explanation I have. Um, you've noticed that Ivanka and Jared have been out of town during all this. We haven't heard boo from them. Um, I just want to pick up, on though, on something that was said that was really important. When Trump attacks the caravans and when he attacks those people who are coming in that is a message that resonates with white nationalists and what we saw in pittsburgh was that playing out um jews have been welcoming to immigrants they have immigrant aid societies and that murderer that white nationalist went after those jews because he believed they were assisting in bringing in black and brown people that were going to destroy whites um, and we're going to undermine them he has already put a target on american jews backs um, so all mm. of this and certainly the um the jews will not replace us where he thought there were some nice people there mm -hmm. um, that's another instance of it i also want to say you know all of the things trump hates cities uh the uh, elite, the media, these are all buzzwords um, in anti-Semitic tropes. Yeah. And what he's painting a picture of is the Jews, the evil city-dwelling elitists who are controlling the media. Um, yeah. And that's more than a dog whistle. That's a bullhorn. Yeah, I, we, we need like twice as much time because I, we didn't even get <laughs> into the idea of him, of him likening himself to God, which is another strange thing. We haven't heard really boo, nothing from the, the Christian right that, you know, is supposed to believe in God that are not. They think this is all ha ha very funny. Uh, Frank Schaefer, thank you very much. Really appreciate you, Jen. We'll be back in our next hour coming up. Uh, Democrats looking to take on Trump need to be ready for an October surprise every day. Are